Let's build a Gradle project utilizing GitHub Actions. So I quickly wanted to explain what we're doing before I actually get into the code. Basically, GitHub Actions is a CI CD or a continuous integration, continuous delivery platform that allows us to create automated scripts that can build, test, or deploy our code to different virtual machines. Well, it sounds really complicated, it's not. It's really just what you're doing on your own local machine, but in an automated structured way. Simply put, we'll have some sort of event occur. Say we actually push commits up into uh, our GitHub repository. And then when that event happens, we trigger something. Maybe we trigger a job that will then build the project and then put our application potentially on like a production server. So you can see that job had some sort of action involved with it. And we will eventually get some sort of result out of our GitHub action. So we do each of these things in what's called a workflow. We do the events, the jobs, and the actions inside of our workflow. And that's created using a YAML file or a configuration file that allows us to kind of define what we want to have happen in our CI CD pipeline. So let's go into actions and build our workflow. If you click on actions and you don't have any set up yet, you'll be met with this page where you can actually use some pre-configured actions for your repository. Basically GitHub did some static analysis of your code and knew that, hey, this is a Gradle project or this is a Maven project or, or this is a website or something like that. And it gives you some suggestions on some potential actions that you can use in your repository. Honestly, these actions are actually really good to get up and going. You could just use this platform just to create whatever action that you need to build the Gradle project. In fact, you could click on configure and then commit those changes and immediately have your action running right away. But I want to build an action together so you know exactly each one of the pieces and you can understand what you're doing or what the actual YAML file is doing for your CI CD pipeline. So let's go ahead and click set up a workflow yourself. From here, you're met with just a main.yaml file. And what you're doing is you're actually just in a code space that you can then commit whatever file this is to your repository. Now on the right here, we'll have some marketplace actions that you can actually include inside of this YAML file if you wanted to. You also have a little documentation window that you can see and sort of read some basics on how to use this workflow. But let's go ahead and start working on our main.yaml file and I'll talk about each one of the pieces line by line. The first line of the workflow is the name, and like the name entails, it's literally the name of the workflow. You can name this whatever you want. You can give it any name that you think fits. For me, I put Java build with Gradle because that's what this workflow is going to be doing. Now, you can ignore the red squirrely lines. It just means that we haven't actually finished the file yet. There's nothing that's happening. We've just given it a name. The next line is the trigger. This is going to be what event occurs in order for this workflow to run. So we start by saying on and we can, you know, use a lot of different events that GitHub automatically gives to you. It doesn't even have to be related necessarily to your repository. Say somebody creates an issue on your repository and you want to add certain labels to the issue so that, you know, you can tag that issue as being a build error or potentially a runtime error or something like that. You can use that as a trigger among a lot of other scenarios that can come up. But for us, it makes sense to trigger on a push because you'll want to build whatever you're creating whenever you push to the repository. Along with the push, you can actually define a lot of different filters. Like say I only want certain branches to trigger this build then I can type out branches and then use an array of all the branches that I want to be included for this workflow to run. Now, there are a lot of different push filters that we can use, including only running on certain files being committed to the repository, or even excluding certain folders or files from allowing it to trigger this build. Say we had a docs folder that had different documentation inside of it. We wouldn't necessarily want this trigger to run because, well, I mean, nothing has changed within the build. Maybe we only want to filter on Java files because those might be the things that need to be rebuilt once we have any changes in them. But now let's just keep it simple and I'll just do it on any push to the repository. The next line are jobs, and this will be what is actually happening in this workflow. Basically, we can have any number of these. Maybe we have a build step that builds the actual Gradle project, and then 
maybe we upload the dependencies, like cache them so that the next time this runs, we don't have to go and grab all the dependencies again in order to build again. This is the meat of the workflow. This will be the actual stuff that we're doing. So now any lines at this tab level will be the actual names of the jobs that we're running. So here, this next line, I just named it build because it's the build job. The next line is runs on, and this will be the virtual machine that we're actually running the build on. Now I've selected Ubuntu latest here, but actually there are a number of different virtual machines that we could use. This table shows all of the available virtual machines that we can use for our runner. And when I say the word runner, what I'm talking about is the job that's running. So what is actually running in this scenario? Basically we're running Ubuntu to then build something. So that's our runner. So you can see on this table that it comes with some predetermined configuration. Now these are the public runners and these are the standard ones that you can use anytime on GitHub but you could actually have a self-hosted one. Say you wanna run on something else like Red Hat or, or something else. You might have a runner established on GitHub so that you can then contact your Red Hat machine and run the build on there. For very generic applications or generic products, you can utilize these public runners, but if you need some specialized case, you might have to create a self-hosted instance of a runner and then build it an action through that. The next couple lines here are the permissions and I've set them to be able to read the repository. This means that it doesn't have any access to actually write to the repository. And we want it that way because we don't want it writing arbitrary data to our repository since all it's doing is building our application. The next line is steps. And this will be the order of operations of things that are happening on our runner, our Ubuntu machine. Now, the thing is these standard virtual machines, they don't have anything installed on them. So you have to define what you need in order to build or do whatever you're trying to do inside of that virtual machine. What I'm doing right here is I am saying that I need this actions checkout and the version four of it in order to check out the repository from GitHub. This checkout is actually a standard action that comes with GitHub. They have a, a bunch of different standard actions that you can use and we're going to use some more here later. Now each step will be given a name and that's just so that we can see it in the action when we're when we're running it. We can see what step it's on. What's nice is again, we have this set up Java action that we can use on our own. And thankfully we already have something set up that we don't have to actually go out and install Java onto this virtual machine. So this with line is actually some specific configuration for this setup Java action that we can use to define, hey, I want to use this Java version with this distribution. So we've set it up to use Java 17 and the distribution be to Murin. So now that we have the JDK installed, what we can do is actually set up Gradle. We again get to utilize the standard actions and we can use the setup Gradle standard action to, uh, to do it all for us. This is its own workflow and it creates all of the Gradle stuff that we need in order to build or run our project. So now that we've set up Java and we've set up Gradle, we can actually just run the build. And what it's using is it's using the Gradle wrapper that's installed in my repository. That's the kind of standard way that everybody uses this. You can add your own Gradle version in here and then build off of that. But what everybody suggests is that you use the Gradle W file to build your application. So now that we have our build step, our job is done. But wait, we kind of want a little bit more functionality. Basically, there's this thing called Dependabot that is installed on every single GitHub repository. And we wanna utilize that. Basically, whenever we have dependencies in our application that come from the outside, when those versions change, we want to be able to add new versions into our project. Well, in order for Dependabot to understand that it needs to update a certain dependency, what we have to do is we have to build a dependency graph and then it can utilize that graph to know, hey, this has a new version and I'm gonna update it. It basically gives us automatic dependency upgrade into our repository without us having to finagle with different dependencies. So we're gonna create another job to build that graph. Here we're calling the job dependency submissions. And again, we're running on the Ubuntu latest virtual machine, but this time we're giving the permission to write because we're actually going to be writing to our repository. Again, we need to be able to check out for all of these steps that we're going to be doing. And we also need to set up the JDK again. So now that we have our JDK set up configured, we can then generate and submit the dependency graph. Thankfully, this is something that happens quite a lot. 
So Gradle actually has their own standard action that we can use again, and it's called dependency submission. And this will do everything that we need it to do. It'll generate and submit the dependency graph for our repository so we can just let Dependabot do its thing. So now we're finished with the workflow and we can commit these changes. So I'll go over here and I'll just hit commit changes. I'll let the commit message be exactly what it generates. And I'll make sure that I'm committing directly to the main branch because that's the only branch that I have right now. I'll hit commit changes and it will automatically commit with my user. Now, if we go back to actions, we can actually see that create main.yaml has now been uploaded and it will be queued for our run. Basically what we'll see here is we'll see the name of the commit that's causing the workflow to run and then a bit of information. So it's saying Java build with Gradle number one, cause it's the first one. And then what commit caused this to get triggered and then who triggered it, which was me. So now over here, you can see that it's queued. This is because this is a public repository. So I'm actually sharing the virtual machines with everybody else that's running virtual machines right now. So I'm in some queue, then I'll have to wait for the actual build to run. If I had my own self-hosted virtual machine, basically I wouldn't have to wait because it would just trigger right away to my virtual machine and then do everything that it needs to do. Granted, this is free for public repositories. For private repositories, you get a certain amount of minutes and however long it takes the build to run or the workflow to run uh, will be charged to you. Basically, you get 2,000 free minutes and anything above 2,000 minutes it gets charged a certain amount. So basically the public runners are free for everybody and the private runners you have to pay for if you exceed the 2000 minutes. So let's go into the workflow and see what's happening. So look at that Murphy's law, something wrong happened. Basically in our build, something failed. Let's click on build and we can see what exactly failed. You can see that we ran the Gradle W build and what we got was a permission denied error. And this is probably because we set the permission to be read and we didn't let it execute. So if we go to the workflow file and then hit the edit button. So now that I'm back at the file, what I'm guessing happened is that I actually didn't have the permission to execute that Gradle W file. It probably got uploaded without the execute permission. So what I'm going to do is use a command called chmod to add the execute permission to the file itself right before we run it. So here you can see that I'm changing the wrapper permissions and I'm running this command chmod plus x to add the execute permission to the file. So I'll commit these changes and I'll let the commit message be auto-generated and then I'll hit commit changes. Now I'll go to actions and hopefully this one works. Okay, great. Now you can see that the build was completed and the dependency submissions was also completed. You can also see that I have a typo here. I didn't put dependency. I'd put dependency, whatever. So in this GitHub Actions screen, what we can do is scroll down and see some of the logs that occurred. So in the build summary, it's giving me a bit of information about what happened. I used Git Gradle, and this all comes from those standard actions that we used. You can see that caching was enabled, so now all of the dependencies will be cached. The build dependencies will be cached. So the next time that we run this, it probably won't run as long as it did this first time. And you can scroll through this and see all of the different dependencies that were saved and a summary report of the runtime. And again, for the dependency submissions, we also get a summary for that along with the caching that was enabled. If we want, we can go into any one of these and actually see what was executed. So you can see that we set up the job, it did some commands, uh, then we ran our actions. It did the checkout action. Here it's setting up Java 17. And then we actually set up Gradle. And then we do the change wrapper permissions, which we're just running that chmod command. And then we're running the build. And here you can see the actual build log of the Gradle W build command. What's nice is you can go very granular and see what potentially caused some build error or what may be wrong with your repository or what's right if it all passes. So what's nice is since our dependency submissions was finished and it successfully ran, we can actually go to insights and then go to dependency graph and we can see all of the dependencies in our application. So if I scroll through here, you can see all of the dependencies that I actually have added in my Gradle configuration. You can also see what depends on your application or library, and you can also have Dependabot if you want to enable it to allow it to upgrade any of the dependencies that you have that can be upgraded. So you can see the GitHub Actions is really quick, easy, and useful 
you can build anything that you want. You can do pretty much anything that you want inside of the actions, any CI CD stuff that you need, any tagging or labeling that you need. Uh, really a lot of different scenarios can be accomplished by using the actions. So with that, that's how you build a Gradle project using GitHub Actions.